Hello, it's great to be back. I'm Elisa Cedres. I'm so I'm going to be your lecturer for today. So it's really nice to be here, although I have just found out that I have 30 minutes instead of an hour for my 51 slides. <laughs> just pictures, I promise you. And that I cannot move. The first time the first part is not difficult. I can breeze through that. Not moving, that might be a challenge. Anyway, um, what I'm trying to do here is connecting a number of different resources that I've been doing for the last uh, 10, 15 years uh, regarding urban environmental history. And uh, coming here to the Bracial Carson Center is always a pleasure, especially when Helmut promised me that I can actually visit the Deutsche Museum, and that's an extra pleasure, but also a challenge because it brings you back to what am I, who am I, what am I doing, what is, if, is what I do exactly environmental history or something different. And I'm finding more and more that uh, the, the way I like to work, the way that I have been working in recent times has been, as, as Anna was telling you, in environmental humanities. Um, so what has environmental history to offer to environmental humanities. That's one of the things that I have been thinking for, for this talk. And, uh, and I have to say, we are great storytellers. So environmental historians tell stories. We tell tales. And that's what, what I would like to invite you to do with me today. Follow me to some of the tales about what, how you make do with the flood in two Latin American cities. So my first tale is a tale of two cities. I know it's not an original title, but what can I say? Some uh, great minds think alike. So uh, my first, uh, the, the tale is about two cities, Rio de Janeiro and Buenos Aires, and they have a lot in common. First thing, they are these capital cities. They underwent this huge transformation in the early 20th century, late 20th century for, for Buenos Aires. And they wanted to be, guess who? The Buenos Aires, the Paris of Latin America. Problem is, quite often, they were instead the Venice of Latin America. Um, those of you who are from Paris, they would say protest, because also Paris has had its own floods, and it's true. But Venice, Aqua Alta, well, it's, it's, uh, um, it's a, 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 big, um, a big reminder what it means to be in Venice in the summer, my gosh. Anyway, in the, um, this is Buenos Aires, uh, um, a neighborhood called La Boca. It's right here. It's a working class neighborhood near the harbor. And until 1990s, it was, uh, has suffered frequent floods. And, and people got used to that. There's an entire set of stories about that. So I was trying to see, uh, and one of the, my favorites is the promises by politicians in 1911 that they're going to get rid of the flooding once for all. Did that happen? Um, in Rio de Janeiro, it's not too different. I mean, you can have things like this. This, the picture on the right is 1940s, Praça Bandeira, and the picture here in the, in the, in my left now, uh, that's the right. It's, the, it's uh, um, Jardim Botânico, a very posh neighborhood in the southern zone of the city. It's probably 1920s, something like this. So floods have been part of the city and it has increased over time as um, uh, trees and uh, unpaved uh, roads give place to cement and roads and buildings. And my point, however, is that you have protests even very early in the 20th century, both in Buenos Aires and Rio de Janeiro, like in this um, news from the, from the, the magazine Omalho, when they protest not only about the flood, but politicians who didn't take care uh, of, uh, of the works necessary to keep the flood. Uh, in some cases, however, it also worked as a, as a selling point. 
This is for 1912, um, and the um, subtitle said, look at this wonderful automobile uh, that could go through the flood with no problem. You can buy your own at this address. And uh, I like that you have just in front of the automobile uh, a, a little boat going through the same road. So some people just use the flood as advertising. If you can, why not? Uh, an interesting element, however, as in most environmental disasters, is that the flood climate events, they, uh, they have an impact in both wealthy and poor um, populations. But they affect wealthy and poor populations in different ways. And social vulnerability is quite often also environmental vulnerability. Uh, some people, however, make do with the flood. And uh, I found these great pictures of the 1966. This is uh, what you're seeing here. It's a road, OK? It's a tunnel. And uh, so you have the kids just turned that under, underpass in a nice swimming pool. Why not? Um, so sometimes can be fun. Sometimes can be just uh, an excuse for you to take your pants in the middle of the, of the streets. Why not? And Sometimes it's not so much fun. Uh, the big problem for the floods in Rio, it's not so much the water that comes from below, but the, the, the occupation of the hills and the way you change the topsoil, you uh, increase the erosion, and you can have landslides. And that's a, this is a very um, um, well-to-do middle, middle upper class neighborhood in, um, in Rio de Janeiro called Laranjeiras. And this was a favela that just fell through. So this is a moment when the, the well-to-do remember, oh, we have poor people very, living very close to us. In fact, literally on the top of us. That's what happened. So um, the floods ended up being moments in which the city has to think as an organism. You cannot just delegate, uh, uh, separate, segregate. Both Rio de Janeiro and Buenos Aires are very segregated cities. Uh, you cannot segregate the most uh, environmentally and socially vulnerable just to their own sort. Um, and that's something that we have been hap uh, uh, learning in the tale told by the documents, by the pictures, by the newspapers in both Buenos Aires and, um, and Brazil. Oh, this is another picture that um, in many, many of these cases, what we have are, are, are uh, fatalities. In the case of Morro da Babilonia, which I have been working with, uh, just last year, a landslide caused the death of three women in a single night, uh, be exactly because of the rains. Um, do in this story, however, we have these two cities that were both viewing for this title of Paris of, um, of the South America during the entire 20th century, having, although they are very different cities, they have very similar urban environmental problems. So I have been trying to, to locate what they tell us. The problems are caused by in, in different ways. So there's a, a bio, uh, uh, there's a biophysical analysis that tells us where the problems of the floods comes from in Rio. In the case of the Rio of Rio de Janeiro is a coastal tropical city. So it's near the sea. We have the problems with special. It's a very seasonal. Uh, uh, um, problem with the summer rainstorms. While in Buenos Aires, the big influence is not so much the ocean as it was the River de la Plata. So if you have big rains in the, um, in the Andean area, uh, the water is going all the way down River de la Plata. So even if you don't have the rains in Buenos Aires, you are going to have the flooding. You may have the flooding. So uh, in the case of Rio de Janeiro, the ocean temperature may have a big impact. So climate change is something that you're looking at. Um, because uh, warmer oceans mean more rainstorms, summer rainstorms. In the case of Buenos Aires, the glaciers may play a, a role. Both are mega cities. Rio de Janeiro is still fighting. We still have several cases of deadly cases of landslides. 
Buenos Aires has, uh, has had some limited success, mostly in the, the, uh, the neighborhood of La Boca. But uh, one important thing for us to understand is that flooding in both cases means different things. In the case of Rio de Janeiro, the danger comes from the hills, even if you do have floodings in some areas. In the case of Buenos Aires, though the problems are the underground rivers and the way the water comes from the Rio de la Plata and feeds all these underground rivers and the water go, comes up. So from the top or from up. And that's part of the tale that I want to tell you. But that's not enough. It just tells us about cities and numbers and uh, official documents and, uh, and projects. How people live these tales. And that's the second tale that I have to you. Donna Laura. Donna Laura, uh, I interviewed her in um, 2013, and she told me her tale from 50 years earlier. The big storm of 1967. In 1967, we, uh, in the beginning of the dictatorship in Brazil, there's an entire discussion about the politicization of uh, Rio de Janeiro politics against uh, the military politics, which I'm not going to get there. But we have one of the largest floods um, in, in, in record. It's not even the largest one. I mean, in this setting here, just 15 years, I was able to find 10 um, rainstorms, rainfalls that were more important than that particular one. But it remained in the memory of the Cariocas, people from Rio de Janeiro, as the, um, the flood of the century. It's not so much so important in the sense how much water actually um, uh, they, they measured, but how people perceived that particular uh, flood. Every single one of these later um, storms was always measured against the flood of the century, 66. And it was really a disaster. We had abs about 200 people dead in 24 hours. Uh, the, and the much larger the uh, number of displaced people, especially those who lived in close to the uh, risky areas in the hills. There has been a change in terms of uh, uh, protection of, uh, of uh, public works, of uh, public defense, but mostly we are talking about displaced people, mostly black, poor, dispens uh, displaced people. So they were taken, this is one of the, the shelters for displaced people, and most of them were taken for, to Maracanã. Any of you who knows soccer, you know this is the temple of modern soccer, okay? Largest stadium in the, okay, let's not go there. Uh, the entire stadium was turned into um, a big shelter which was very interesting uh, because it was one of the few times, few, not even COVID did that, but the soccer season in Rio de Janeiro was suspended. Yeah, a disaster. Uh, the point is, uh, for me it was important, why? Because after a couple of months, uh, I couldn't find in the newspapers, more news about the flood, what happened, happened, what had happened to the refugee, to displaced people, and so on. I was looking to the one journal after another, and no news about that. And then I realized I had to look in the sports papers, because they were complaining about the displaced people still located in uh, in the stadium, and it was it's like the, the entire city had forgotten about. Uh, displaced people, but not the owners of the of the soccer clubs. So that's how I follow through the, the the story of Dona Laura. We had children. We have uh, a number of problems in uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, of hygiene, etc. If you remember Katrina and the Superdome, you can imagine what it means uh, to live in a ye for a year in this kind of situation. Eventually, the situation was so bad that the, um, the government, the state government promised that a new um, uh, housing project that had been designed for um, public serv civil servants would be used for the displaced people. That's the famous area called the City of God. The movie, 
So if any of you have seen. City of God so was prepared to be a place for our civil servants and it was going to be, was to be used for environmental displaced people. Environmentally displaced people. So houses were like this. They were not even ready by the time that people moved there, but they had, there was just a problem. Uh, if 1966 was the flood of the century, you are supposed to have another flood like that just in 2066, right? That's not the way environmental uh, things work. So we had another flood like this just a year after that. 1967 was another big flood with a huge number of displaced people again. And that, th that moment, okay, we are not going to miss another soccer season, not this time. Anyway, uh, that's the moment when Donna Laura comes to our story. She lived not in a hill, but in a very poor neighborhood called Bento Ribeiro, probably in a house like this. And if there had not been some landslide, her house would have been heavily affected by the floods. Her husband was in the hospital, sick for about months for tuber with tuberculosis. He couldn't work, and she, at 25, had already four kids. So she had to, to take a number of decisions. Uh, and th that's what she found out. She found herself, she lived in a house like that. It was in the backyard of the godson of one, godfather of one of her, uh, of her sons. And it was impossible to live. So she thought, oh, I have to make a decision. And last year with the flood, with the rains, uh, the government promised houses to people. People got houses. May I try as well? So she left. She was not officially a displaced person. She was not living in, uh, um, in a hill. She did have not lost her house then due to the landslides. So she didn't qualify. But what she did, she got her four kids and she went to Maracanã, Maracanãzinho in that point. And she asked, I'm a displaced person. I want a house. And they accepted her. So Dona Laura went to this situation. She lived in these conditions for about a year. Six months in Maracanãzinho, and later on, she went to this place called Fazenda Modelo, which was a shelter for homeless people. And the word concentration camp, and for me to use this in German is kind of uh, sensitive, but it was used in the newspapers. In the sense, she remembers this. When the lights went out, we had to cover our ears. When they turned their on, it was even worse. Those screams, people screamed when the lights went on, went off. They're horrible. Food was given rice and beans with the basic staples of Brazil, and they were just uh, basically raw. People were not, was not able to eat. Her four children couldn't understand that, and so the oldest uh, begged her mom several times for them to leave Fazenda Modelo, and she said she wouldn't because she wanted the house. Eventually, she got the house. She went to live in Cidade de Deus, where I went to interview her 50 years after the fact. So this is pretty much the Via Crucis that uh, Dona Laura made. Bento Ribeiro, Maracanã, then Fazenda Modelo, and finally City of God. That's her tale. That's what flood and displacement and landslide and environmental, uh, urban environmental history meant to Dona Laura. That's the kind of experience that those numbers I mentioned before, that, that tale of two cities represent for people who live there. Follow me for another tale. Don Luis, he didn't allow us to take pictures. Don Luis was known in the very nice neighborhood of Palermo as the weatherman. He was quite poor. Uh, this is Buenos Aires in 1985. Those are areas where you have a number of different, uh, very serious flooding incidents in 85. Newspapers, that's the only thing they would talk about. Those, we have problems with uh, electricity, um, this, um, uh, uh, flooding of schools, uh, no transit, etc. And it was pretty much like this. The, all those points of the city would be this, this big. Um, but so Luis was very interested in this area here, Palermo. Palermo is a very nice neighborhood. And he is a hairdresser. He was a hairdresser. He wanted to have his own business. But he could never, ever afford a place in Palermo. 
Except that there was the first flood, and then the next year, another flood, and then the next year, another flood. And real estate in Palermo, prices in Palermo just went downhill. So, so Luis said, okay, I'm going to buy this. And he actually was able to afford it when in any other circumstance he couldn't. Uh, this is just after, this picture is from, eight, from a, a later flood, but that's the way Palermo stays when you have the, the floods. So I asked, well, why would you buy, put all your savings and your family savings in a place which is going to be flooded? Because it's not like the floods are going to stop. And he decided he had to adapt. So why he wanted that? Because it was a very posh neighborhood with three bus slides, lots of cars, lots of people, money. Uh, if in the floods, much better, there's less competition. What he did, that's pretty much the way the, it's another peluqueria, another hairdresser salon, but that's the way they are, they, they are in Palermo with this, usually this glass window. So you can imagine during the flood what it means to have a glass window. Cars go back and forth, they break, etc. So what he did, first he had an old Palm Pilot, which he showed me, in which he would listen every single day, every, the weather. And he would notice the provisions for the weather, for the sudestada, the big wind that could change things. And he would take very much, uh, attention, uh, pick very much attention to that. He would also look to this manhole. This is a manhole uphill to Palermo. So I told you that the problem with Buenos Aires are underground rivers. So what he did, he would check Every time there was the risk of a flood or risk of a, a, a bad storm, he would check in this manhole. He, if he, he would put a, a small uh, stick, and if the underground river was uh, uh, to a certain point, okay, we are going to have a flood. And he, you, you do hatches to the door and to the, like this, he, and he would, he would tell his neighbors about that, and he, was, he adapted an old submarine hatch to the, to the toilet seat. Because the big problem is this, as in France most people know, the, the water comes from the sewage. And even if you protect the store from the window, the pipes and tubulations inside the store are flooding. So he, what he did, whenever the river, the underground river was up, he would lock the, uh, the, um, the toilet seat. And his store was the only thing that wouldn't flood in the, in the entire neighborhood. So soon, people start asking him, so how is going to be the flood is today and tomorrow? And, and he became, so it's, it was part of his cachet in the neighborhood to be the weatherman. Everybody knew Don Luis. And he, in fact, said he's very proud of that. I was coming from Brazil to interview him because of the hatches. You're kidding me. So listen, people come from Avellaneda, from far away, to ask me about the hatches. Because for them, there is flooding. And the water comes out of the sewage, and not with me. So these are ex exceptional stories. I know that. For each case of Dona Laura and, um, and Seu Luis with their dreams, I can tell tons of stories of loss, of grief, of, uh, of displacement with no redress. But maybe they are not so exception, because now instead of talking about, uh, make, telling a tale of another person, I'm going to tell you the tale, this is the thing that I have been working more recently, Morro da Babilonia. Morro da Babilonia is a nice uh, neighborhood, very close to, uh, very close to, to Copacabana, that's right here. And uh, they have been, uh, they claim to be an old Quilombo, a place, an older place for runaway slaves in the 19th century. Maybe it's true, maybe not. And flooding is not the bigger problem they have. Crime it is. This is uh, um, an AK um, uh, in one of the trees that have been planted. Another problem, a very serious problem, is that the constant threat by the municipality to re forcibly remove vulnerable uh, communities for their own good, which means that the, the, uh, the, the, the mandatory displacement of the entire community. So what they do, and, and floods, of course, landslides are a problem. 
So even last year we have uh, some of some that. What they, do, they did, like in, in 1995, four, when there was a, a large landslide and when three people were, uh, were killed, they joined with uh, a project by the city hall for reforestation. And that's the result after 30 years. This is how it was in 1995. This is the result. I think this picture is 2017. This is work by the community together with the city hall. And now it has changed completely the identity of the community. They present themselves are not as a dangerous community, full of crime and, and, uh, and risk, but someone who's uh, giving a service to the city as a whole. They learned how to plant. That was not their goal in, in, initially. Their goal was just to get some money and to protect, and, uh, to protect themselves from the threat of removal. They learned how to plant. They have been doing this for 30 years. They, 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 they are proud of the service they, uh, they, they give to the city. And they have learned about Atlantic Forest. They learned the language of environmental conservation. So, why do their tales matter? Dona Laura, Seu Luis, Mabilonia River. And that's what I would like to invite you to think. What I'm doing here is uh, um, it's an argument in, pro, in defense of oral environmental history. It's one of the last, a very underused methodology. I can talk about Jan uh, Holmes um, and Esther's and some recent articles in the last 15, 10 years have been talking about environmental or environmental history, but it's very, very underused. And it's important. Environmental historians like to, to, um, like to hear, uh, try to listen to trees, which is great. Soil, fantastic. Biophysical indicators, why not? Climate, be my informant. But let's listen to people too. Especially people from the most vulnerable uh, groups who are saying over and over again how social, socially um, uh, vulnerable people are also environmentally vulnerable people. So let's listen to them. Their voices are the ones that are the least pro likely to be recorded in official documents. So why shouldn't we try to, to redress that? Especially because, as we saw in those three tales, they have an ingenuity and a resourcefulness that comes from when you have to deal with environmental risk every day. So my point is that when you talk about large and local solutions for global problems, sometimes, maybe, perhaps, vulnerable communities may have the, 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 um, the blueprint for that. Not they are always good, sometimes they are not, but they may have. Let's listen to them to make sure about that. Especially because if there's one thing that we repeat in environmental history, it's that nature is not only nature, that the separation between nature and society is just, it's more um, strategic teaching tool. For Dona Laura, for uh, Seu Luis, they live this. Climate, weather, floods are not only water. These are their livelihoods, opportunities, hopes, dreams, pitfalls. That's what urban environmental history represents to them. And maybe they may have some ideas to delay the end of the world. Okay? So thank you so much. That's what. <laughs>